This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. White noise is a type of noise where equal power is produced at every frequency across the entire range of audible frequencies. It sounds like this. Going by its simplest definition, if white noise were text in a book, it would be every character that is possible to print, printed in every position, ink could be applied. Depending upon the system doing the printing, maybe those positions are discrete. Maybe they don't cover every square millimeter of every page, but rather only specific predetermined regions where characters can possibly go. Many systems have limits, and white noise always stays within the limits. For this book, maybe there are margins. Maybe there are limits in lines with space between them. There's a spot for a chapter title up at the top of every even page at the center, and opposite it, at the top of every odd page, the author's name, or the title of the book. And of course, there are the page numbers in the bottom of the corners. So let's say that the system is so designed to print only in these very specific places and nowhere else. And so printing the white noise of text in this book using such a system, what we end up with is however many pages bound, showing a darkened block in the center of every page where the main body of the text would go, plus darkened spots in all of those other places. And again, depending upon the system, depending upon how many characters it has at its disposal for printing those spots upon which it prints, the page number corners, the chapter title spot, the main text block rectangle, the lines themselves, and each individual position, discrete or not, for the letters that comprise each line, they could all be solid dark with ink, just black. If the characters, when overlaid, all of them, one on top of the other, leave no white space of paper shining through. A zero on top of a nine, on top of an eight, on top of a seven, and so on through the alphabet and all its letters, capitals and lowercase, all the accented letters, the Arabic alphabet, Cyrillic, kanji, katakana, and so on until the total character set is laid down in every single position along whatever printable space there is. Solid, dark. Paper beneath, but No paper peeking through layers upon layers of ink. If the number of characters is small, say all the letters of the Roman alphabet, unaccented, capitals and not, all the Arabic numerals, punctuation, but nothing further, you might be left with areas of significantly less ink density. Still a considerable amount printed at every possible position, but with little corners and divots, valleys of paper between otherwise murky re-re-re-applications of pigment. Not quite a solid dark field, not welcoming, still an unfriendly, uneven porcupine of a printed shape, but not a solid black field. However it works, it works like so. Every place where information, whatever information is made available, can be placed, it is placed with equal importance in comparison to all the other places. Even, consistent, not nonsense, but not clear meaning either. (laughs) 
If white noise were a baseball game, it would be every possible play at every position at every given moment. This would become rather difficult rather quickly as you'd run out of players long before you'd run out of plays and positions to perform them in, and so this system, we'd hit its limits rather quickly. At least, assuming this is a standard-sized baseball game and we're not allowing literally anyone to rush the field in the hopes of constructing white noise baseball. Let's assume we're not doing that, not opening those floodgates. We'd also hit the limits of each individual player's system rather quickly. Every play there is in every position, a physically and mentally arduous task, to say the least. So, suffice it to say, once we involve bodies, non-mechanical, non-electronic, no instant recall storage systems, no easily refilled resources like ink or paper, white noise becomes a much harder thing to ape. White noise, this white noise, will last for however long, within reason. The white noise of baseball would be, if it is even possible, a very brief affair. Human bodies, like grains of sand on a vibrating plate moving every which way, attempting to give equal importance to all possible instances where information is produced within the system. A guy running the Jumbotron has it easy. Video white noise is a facile and familiar thing. Not at all strenuous, but the pitcher, the catcher, the infielders, the players, and the dugouts... Depending upon how far we stretch the system of baseball, the hot dog vendors, the bartenders in the park, the audience, the announcers and commentators, the woman who sells t-shirts and the scalper out at the front of the park, how do they even manage? What even is the action they are taking at any given moment? It feels impossible to imagine the white noise of a singular human body in space taking real physical actions in actual time. We hit the limits of that system so quickly, we don't really get close to approaching the kind of consistency, uniformity, and speed so fast it is still that we associate with traditional white noise. If white noise were a recipe, it would be every preparation you know of every ingredient in your kitchen. If you and your kitchen are the system, the limits of that system are your ability, supported by what you know and what cookware you have, and your ingredients. Some chilies and cabbage in the fridge, a small clutch of potatoes, and that half box of vegetable stock you got from Whole Foods last week. Tons of spices, some heavy cream, rice vinegar, some chickpeas, and so on, and so on, and so on. White noise produces equal information at every point of information production. Remember, at every discrete point where data can be produced or activated, where communication can happen, it does. And each of those discrete points producing does so with equal power, equal importance. How do we do this with food? Do we portion out ingredients in infinitesimally small bits and then at every possible moment one might dash or pinch or stir or add or turn or what have you, do we do that? Quickly it becomes clear that the white noise of recipes is also the white noise of cooks, maybe of kitchens themselves, and suddenly the system is growing beyond its own bounds, not unlike a gray goo, and so perhaps it's best not to follow this train of thought. If white noise were a pop song, it would be, well, here's where things get kind of interesting. Using the devices in our previous few thought experiments, we might imagine the white noise of pop songs to be every note on every available instrument with all the effects and miking techniques available. Something which, if it did not approach the sound of white noise, as we know it, would probably come close. Except, well, white noise is a pop song. Or was. Uh, has been? By some measure, at least. On October 22nd of this year, Taylor Swift, or probably more likely someone who is in charge of clicking buttons and filling out forms on behalf of Taylor Swift, released eight seconds of white noise to iTunes under the name Track 3. It cost $1.29 to download and became the number one selling single in Canada. That's not a joke. Eight seconds of white noise, number one on iTunes, in Canada. 
Guitar player and Sonic Youth co-founder Lee Ronaldo joked on Instagram that Taylor Swift was the first ever noise musician to chart. Noise music, normally seen as devoid of meaning, nonsense for the sake of nonsense, unformed or unfocused aggression, sonically contrarian in a way punk rock could only ever dream, was finally given some kind of wide appeal because of its association with Taylor Swift. There's a complicated thing happening here, specifically the relationship between this work and its author. Though, I mean, that's complicated because really the author is some set of technological processes and an algorithm or two. Maybe there's some human accountability on account of an accidental mouse click. Who's to say? However it went down, the upload of the eight seconds of white noise titled Track 3 was explained as a glitch, somehow related to the early release of another single on Taylor's new record, 1989. Which I like, by the way. Not as much as I like Red. Not yet, at least. But enough. So, the author of track three. Not Taylor, but also, yes, Taylor. That is, of course, the exact reason for the runaway popularity of The Noise, its advertised creator. And so, The Noise, perhaps in other contexts meaningless, nonsense for the sake of nonsense, unformed and unfocused, takes on meaning. Even Lee Ronaldo, however humorous I'm sure his intentions were, sees at least ironic meaning in Taylor's quote-unquote release of White Noise, and it hitting number one. This is the thing about noise, as we touched upon in the Cadillacs of Quiet episode, and we'll probably touch upon in other shifting contexts. It is not in and of itself lacking meaning. To describe something as noise is not to describe a sonic phenomenon itself, but to describe your attitude towards it. And so, to get the white noise of pop songs, we don't need to apply the technical aspects of the creation of white noise to the technical aspects of the creation of pop music. Rather, all we have to do is to get a pop star to release white noise, and it becomes a pop song. Though, I guess really the white noise only achieved a thing that a pop song would ideally achieve. It hit number one. We're not fooling anybody by trying to claim that white noise is in some way actually a pop song in any way other than aspirationally. It has none of the elements that make pop music what it is, no verses or chorus or, well, n notes, strictly speaking. What's instructive really isn't the semantic argument regarding whether white noise has achieved in some way pop songness, but rather what is shown about the pop music environment that this connection here can even be drawn in the first place. In the introduction to her translation of Pierre Schaeffer's essay, Sound and the Century, a socio-aesthetic treatise, Donna Zapf writes about how almost 100 years ago, at the start of the 20th century, French-born American-based composer Edgard Varese wrote, Our musical alphabet must be enriched. We also need new instruments, badly. In my own works, I have always felt the need of new mediums of expression, which can lend themselves to every expression of thought and can keep up with my thought. Varese was not exceptionally well-known in his time, but is a bit of a looming figure in the history of electronic music. His total body of work is only about three hours long, though he did write a few pieces of note and is considered hugely influential. Most famously, his poem Electronique, written for the Phillips Pavilion at the 1958 Brussels World Fair, is considered one of the first major works of electronic music. It makes use of sounds which, at the time, would have been considered distinctly non-musical. Varese also wrote, What we want is an instrument that will give us a continuous sound at any pitch. The composer and the electrician will have to labor to get it. Speed and synthesis are characteristics of our own epoch. We need 20th century instruments to help us realize them in music. 
Verez was the first to describe music as organized sound. This was the designation he gave to his own compositional practice, the organization of sound. And he saw in the future, and perhaps in certain aspects of the present, he was very frequently thinking beyond the ways contemporaneous technology allowed him to operate, a much broader horizon for music than many of his colleagues. He was one of the first great and loudest voices for the sonic liberation of music, championing the possibility of sounds not produced by instruments in an orchestra. He once famously decreed that, to stubbornly conditioned ears, anything new in music has always been called noise. What we have now, today, in 2014, is not only a situation lousy with Verez's 20th century instruments, synthesizers and sequencers, continuous sound across the whole range of human hearing, literally in our pockets, we have the accidental deployment of their output to thousands of people, the result of which is written about snarkily for a couple days after. For better or worse, the techno-musicological revolution so hoped for by the sonic geniuses of the early 20th century has become somewhat uh, mundane. I mean, sure, we still have a long way before so many of our stubbornly conditioned ears are trained to recognize more of the uncommon sounds in the world as musical. Track 3 was an aberration, not a purposeful statement about the production of audio, in the 21st century. It was accepted as musically meaningful, only ironically, only as a way to joke about the state of music and technology and how we make meaning from sonic information. But insofar as speed and synthesis were the characteristics of Verez's epoch, they've become the playthings of ours. I find it so fitting, is maybe the word, that of all the people to have had a piece of white noise released under their name, it was Taylor Swift. Popularly understood to write songs of a significantly emotional bent, well-liked for her seemingly kind demeanor, good-humored, easygoing, put-together, feminine, at every turn perhaps in no way more different than the experience of listening to white noise grating, emotionless, harsh, and random, if not directly masculine, then masculine by association through its use and our reaction to it. So, fitting that Taylor released eight seconds of noise, except for the fact that it doesn't fit at all. Which brings me, in some kind of conclusion, to French sound theorist Michel Chion and his book Audiovision. In it, he talks about what he terms empathetic and an empathetic sound. Shion is a famous scholar and theoretician of the connections between moving image and sound. He wrote extensively about the way we perceive audio and film to push and pull against one another in the assemblage that is cinema. Empathetic sound, he explains, is that which just echoes the emotional content of a scene. A sad scene, sad music. Happy scene? Jaunty music. An empathetic music, on the other hand, as you might guess, does the opposite. Whatever the emotional content of a scene happens to be, the sound works against it. Xian points out a favorite an empathetic sound trope is the use of something like a single music box to signify madness. Though the psyche of the person may be tumultuous, raging with conflicting emotion and a nonstop flurry of sentiment, sonically, the madness is represented simply and straightforwardly. Shion writes that this has the effect of, quote, not freezing the emotion, but rather of intensifying it by inscribing it on a cosmic background. The world, the sound and noise of it, is not a personal soundtrack except in the imaginary space of cinema. 
It is mostly a dispassionate force, and so when the known emotions of performers are inscribed upon it, they become intensified as an effect of their juxtaposition. More so, unexpectedly, than taking the easy route and simply matching scene to music choice one for one. So, I can't help but wonder, towards what views of our pop music scene does track three show empathy, or an empathy? The former seems easy. An industry so up in the air and hectic, a set of tools and technology and personnel all working together in some vaguely Tasmanian devil-ish cloud out of which pops occasionally a record of great critical and or popular success. A million points of information all attempting to construct their meaning, all of equal importance. The white noise of the music industry. The latter, however, is a little harder. To what scene is track three anempathetic? Well, if white noise is, in some way, this perfectly mutable thing, maximum information and minimum meaning, until it is put in some situation where we are ready, willing, and able to find some kind of great meaning for it, then maybe the situation is one where meaning is not even sought. If white noise is the frantic, random, but consistent production of information, would it be anempathetic to a scene which is boring? Predictable? Where there is a consistent production of nothing? Of silence? Either way, it seems fair to say that the white noise of pop songs might be just that. White noise. And this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Instagram at ReasonablySND, and you can find me on Twitter and Tumblr at Mike Rugnetta. <laughs>